Welcome back to Mad Hatter's Civil War Battle Series. In today's episode, we focus on the Battle of New Orleans. From the deck of the Hartford, Flag Officer David Farragut watched his signal officer in the rigging above him. When a 285-pound mortar shell landed in Fort Jackson, the signal officer waved a red flag. When the shell did not explode on target, he waved a white flag. The signal officer waved the white flag more often than the red. I guess we go up river tonight. Someone overheard Farragut mutter. With this decision, Farragut started events that would lead to an attack on the largest city in the Confederacy, New Orleans. As a banking center and the major port for exports coming down the river, it was a rich prize indeed. But to get at the city, Farragut's ships would have to do what many experts considered impossible. Steam up the lower river past two powerful forts built especially to prevent such an excursion, Forts Jackson and St. Philip. Assistant Secretary of the Navy Gustav Fox first proposed running the ships past the forts in the summer of 1861. The proposal countered prevailing naval thinking that wooden ships could not stand against forts. But early Union naval victories along the Atlantic seaboard had convinced him that this was not true. He persuaded Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells to suggest the scheme to President Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was not enthusiastic about the operation until Commander David Porter arrived in Washington in November. Porter's idea was much the same as Fox's. Having spent 76 days on blockade duty outside the mouth of the Mississippi, Porter had one thing Fox lacked, current information on Confederate defenses. After Porter explained the situation to Lincoln, the president said, Fish should have been done sooner. The Mississippi is the backbone of the rebellion. It is the key to the whole situation. Major General George B. McClellan had just replaced Winfield Scott in command of the Union armies when they called upon him. Despite the situation, McClellan always believed the enemy had many more troops than he did. So he approved the attack on New Orleans, so long as he did not have to send any of the troops from the Army of the Potomac. This set the stage for the emergence of one of the most controversial figures of the Civil War, Major General Benjamin Butler. A war Democrat from Massachusetts, Butler was a man whose support Lincoln needed. In addition, Butler offered to raise several regiments in New England. But, because McClellan did not like him, he ordered Butler and his newly raised regiments to the New Orleans operation. Fox had proposed steaming past the forts, but Butler thought the Union forces first needed to reduce the forts by smashing them with 13-inch seize mortars mounted on the decks of ships. Consequently, Wells gave Porter command of a mortar flotilla with the authority to outfit 20 schooners to serve as bomb vessels. About the same time in Missouri, Major General John C. Fremont came to a conclusion similar to Porter's. He ordered the construction of 40 mortar boats to reduce Confederate fortifications along the central Mississippi. He already had a foundry in Pittsburgh casting the giant guns. But Porter got Washington to intercede, resulting in the foundry shipping the first 20 mortars to New York for mounting on his schooners. Attached to the mortar flotilla were six gunboats. Some were converted ferry boats that were so strong Porter could use them as tugs to maneuver the mortar schooners in the river. The man Wells wanted to overall command of the expedition was Porter's foster brother, 60-year-old Captain David Farragut, who had impressed Wells with his boldness during the Mexican War. But the appointment was not without criticism. Some questioned Farragut's loyalty. He was born in Tennessee and had spent a number of years in Louisiana. So Wells first sent Porter to question him. He then summoned Farragut to Washington, where Farragut met with Fox and Postmaster General Montgomery Blair. 
Fox gave Farragut a list of ships and asked if he could take New Orleans with them. After scanning the names, the venerable captain told Fox he could do it with two-thirds that number. Blair went to Lincoln, convinced Farragut could take New Orleans. When Farragut met with Wells, the secretary told him about the mortar attack that was to precede the run past the forts. Farragut agreed to use the mortars if ordered to, but he doubted that they would be effective. He ventured the opinion that they might even be counterproductive because they would warn the Confederates that an attack was coming. Through all this, Wells and Fox kept the operation a secret. They even kept Secretary of War Simon Cameron ignorant of it. An unexpected benefit of the secrecy was the Confederate authorities' fixation on the ironclads under construction near St. Louis. Confederate authorities in Richmond became convinced that the main threat to New Orleans would be a strike from the north. The fleet placed under Farragut's command was comprised of the Colorado, a 40-gun steam frigate, four sloops carrying 22 to 24 guns each, the sidewheeler Mississippi with 17 guns, three corvettes, each with seven to nine guns, and eight gunboats carrying two guns each. The gunboats had a heavy and a light gun on the pivots so they could fire to either side. None of the ships could fire at a target immediately in the front. In mid-March, the Union Navy entered the Mississippi Delta at Pass Al Altour. Getting across the bar was difficult. The crews had to remove guns, coal, sails, and spars from the Pensacola and Mississippi to usher them across. The Richmond ran aground seven times trying to cross. When all the mortar schooners were across, Porter sent his steamers back to help the warships. But the mighty Colorado would not pass over the bar, even unburdened of the guns and much equipment. Farragut tried for two weeks to nurse it across before giving up. By leaving her behind, he lost almost 20% of his firepower. Still, Farragut had several intangible advantages. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had built and maintained Forts Jackson and St. Philip. Before leaving Washington, Wells gave Farragut detailed engineering drawings of both forts, plus a detailed description by Brigadier General John Bernard, who had helped rebuild them. Farragut also had a ship from the U.S. Coast Survey. He sent it ahead to find the best channel over the bar. In addition, while the warships prepared for fighting in the river, the surveyors established landmarks so Porter would know the exact distance and angle to each fort, even if the forts were not in sight. White flags along the shore showed where each mortar schooner was to anchor and how far it was to the center of each fort. In mid-April 1862, one year after the Confederate bombardment of Fort Sumter in Charleston, the Union warships and mortar schooners moved up the river. On October 16th, Farragut authorized Porter to begin the bombardment when he was ready. Fort Jackson was on the western bank on the inside bend of the river, and its defenders had cut down trees to give themselves a clear view of part of the river below them. Fort St. Philip was farther upriver on the eastern bank. Porter placed the 1st and 3rd Divisions of his flotilla on the west bank of the river, so the lead schooner was exactly 2,850 yards from Fort Jackson and 3,680 yards from Fort St. Philip. From the mast, lookouts could see the forts, but to disguise the mast rising above the trees, they covered them with brush. The second division was set on the east bank, 3,680 yards from Fort Jackson, in full view of the Confederate forts. By the morning of April 18th, Admiral David Dixon Porter was ready to begin the attack. The defenses Farragut faced seemed formidable, but reality might have been less so. The Confederates had a large variety of weapons and commands to oppose an advance by the Union Navy but that diversity harbored weakness. The heart of the Confederate defenses were the two masonry forts. These plus available ships comprised 192 guns, but only one-third were large caliber of 32-pound or larger. 
When Major General Manfield's Lovell took command in December, he tried to secure larger guns, but the Richmond government deemed his department a low priority. Lovell decided that the forts would be effective only if the Union Navy could be forced to remain stationary in front of them. To stop their advance, he built a barrier across the river 500 yards below Fort Jackson. His men built what he called a raft across the river. This raft was composed of cypress logs four or five feet in diameter and 40 feet long, chained together with two and a half inch iron cables. Fifteen anchors at the end of the 180-foot chains held the raft in place. Lovell recognized how vulnerable New Orleans was. The Confederate authorities in Richmond saw the direct threat to the Crescent City as a thrust up the river, but there was also a dozen bayous and canals that could allow the Union Navy to outflank the forts. Lovell thus established two lines of defense for New Orleans— Brigadier General Johnson Duncan commanded the outer line, Forts Jackson and St. Philip, which blocked the direct approach from the sea. An interior line guarded the city proper from land attacks by forces that may have avoided the forts. This line ran from Charlemagne on the river to Lake Pontchartrain north of the city. More fortifications protected the western bank of the river in New Orleans from the north and west. To add to his difficulties, Lovell had trouble keeping troops and weapons in New Orleans. When Albert Sidney Johnston collected troops for the offensive that ended at Shiloh, 5,000 of Lovell's men transferred to Corinth, taking with them most of the weapons Lovell had. The real key to defending New Orleans against a naval attack was a Confederate navy. Unfortunately, in 1861, the priority for the Confederacy was building an army and not a navy. One of the few ships Lovell did have was the ironclad ram Manassas. Perhaps an early success deluded Confederate officials into thinking they had nothing to fear from a Union Navy attack up the Mississippi. The story goes back to May of 1861, when John Stevenson began converting the steamer Enoch train into an ironclad commerce raider he named the Manassas. Five months later, Lieutenant Alexander Worley seized the ship for the Confederacy. The Manassas was poorly armed, but Worley intended to use her as a ram. Unfortunately, the Manassas was so slow it could barely move against the current. The day he seized the Manassas, Worley led some converted wooden gunboats against the Union blockade at the head of the passes, where the Mississippi River, well below New Orleans, branches into three major outlets to the Gulf of Mexico and where the Union flotilla was gathered. An attempt to ram the Union ship Richmond failed, and the supporting gunboats did not arrive. Nevertheless, the Union Navy fled outside the bar and remained there until Farragut's arrival in March of 1862. To create ships that could stop the Union Navy, Confederate Secretary of the Navy Stephen Malloy issued contracts for the building of two new ironclads, the Mississippi and the Louisiana. But the designs of the ships were ambitious. The Mississippi, if completed, would be the most fearsome and swiftest warship ever made, and beyond the capability of the South to build from scratch. The completion dates continued to slip from one delay after another. What Lovell lacked in solid warships he made up for in diversity and numbers. Beside the Manassas, he had several wooden gunboats converted from civilian use early in the war. The state of Louisiana also had its own gunboats. In addition, there was the river defense fleet, six river steamers turned into rams and commanded by John Stevenson, the same man who had built the Manassas. Commanding the Governor Moore, a Louisiana state sidewheeler, was Captain Beverly Kennan, a former U.S. Navy officer. After the war, Kennan described his ship, her bow was like that of hundreds of other vessels being faced along its length on the edges above the water with two strips of old-fashioned flat railroad iron kept in place by short straps of like kind at the top, at the waterline, and at the three intermediate points. 
These straps extended about two feet of bait, the face of the stem on each side where they were bolted in place. The other rams had their noses hardened in like manner. All had the usual shaped stems. Not one had an iron beak or protecting prow under water. The Confederate defenses lacked weapons, men, and ships. But perhaps the worst flaw was the command structure. Lieutenant Colonel Edward Higgins commanded the forts, but had no authority over the ships next to them. Mitchell commanded the Confederate Navy, but his authority extended only to the Confederate ships. The ships of Louisiana did not have to follow his orders. Stevenson made it clear that the river defense fleet was taking orders from no one. Every officer and man on the river defense expedition joined it with the condition that it was to be independent of the Navy and that it would not be governed by the regulations of the Navy or be commanded by a naval officer. When the mortars opened fire on the morning of April 18th, the guns in the two forts returned the fire. Because of the work by the surveyors, the mortars quickly found their targets. The Confederates took longer to find their marks, and their fire concentrated on the exposed 2nd Division. To try to suppress the Confederate fire, Porter sent the gunboat Oswego to the head of the 2nd Division to fire its 11-inch smoothbore. She stayed there under fire for almost two hours, retiring only when she ran out of ammunition. About five o'clock, the Union officers saw fire near Fort Jackson. Most believe it was a fire raft, but Porter went up the river after dark to get a better view. He reported to Farragut that he thought the fort was on fire. Indeed, several years later, an officer inside the fort wrote Porter that, The citadel and all buildings in the rear of the fort were fired by bursting shell and also the sandbag moles that had been thrown around the magazine doors. The fire, as you are aware, raged with great fury, and no effort of ours could subdue it. On April 19th, Confederate tugs maneuvered the Louisiana down to Fort St. Philip, where they anchored her. Mechanics then came down to install her machinery, while sailors installed cannon. But to the dismay of her commander, John Mitchell, the ports were too small to aim the cannon. Thus, after the war, Cannon wrote sarcastically that the Louisiana could float and do nothing more. Higgins wanted Mitchell to deploy the Louisiana downriver where her guns could drive off Porter's mortar schooners, but he refused. He cited several reasons, perhaps the most compelling being that a hit from one of those massive mortar shells would send the ironclad straight to the bottom. By the third day, Porter's bombardment neared its end. The crew had fired 16,800 shells and were almost out of ammunition. Farragut summoned his ship commanders to a meeting at 10 p.m. to discuss alternative courses of action. John Alden, captain of the Richmond, read a letter from Porter to Farragut, complaining that the defenders would cut the ships to pieces unless Farragut gave Porter's mortars more time. There was also the problem of the makeshift barrier across the river. To overcome it, Lieutenant Charles Caldwell of the gunboat Itzka volunteered to cut an opening in the barrier if a second vessel could help. Farragut decided Caldwell could not control his ship in the channel and command the operation at the same time. So he put Commander Henry Bell in command of the Itzka and Pinola with orders to make an opening in the barrier during the night. Thus, during the day, the crews of the two ships removed the ship's lower mast and rigging. That night, before the moon rose, they maneuvered the two vessels upriver to the barrier. To keep the Confederates pinned down, the mortar boats increased their rate of fire. As the gunboats approached the raft, they fired a couple of rockets. The forts opened up, but their shots were high. Once the two Union ships were against the barrier, the Confederates had trouble distinguishing them from the hulks, and the ships went about their mission without further interference. 
The Panola moved up to the third hulk from the eastern shore. Her crew set gunpowder charges to blow the chains that connected it to the ships on either side. They also rigged a torpedo with an electric detonator to go off under the bow. But the Panola backed away faster than the operator could lay out wire, and it broke. To add to the frustration, the fuses on the other two charges failed to ignite. Over on the east side, the Itzka ran a grappling hook to the railing on the shoreside hulk. As the current pulled the gunboat downstream, the railing broke off. The Itzka then moved up to the barrier again. This time, Caldwell kept the engine running to keep her in place. His plan was to blow the chains loose, but the crew discovered one chain was merely wrapped around the anchor chain. When they dropped the anchor chain in the water, it carried the second chain with it. Freed from the restraining chain, the Hulk and the Itzka drifted down the river and became lodged upon the eastern river bank. Caldwell then sent a boat to the Panola, which was steaming upriver to try again. The Federals ran two ropes to the stranded Itzka, but she was so hard aground that both ropes broke trying to loose her. The second try, with a larger hawser, then pulled the Itzka free. But instead of returning to safety, Caldwell took the warship past the barrier along the bank until she was almost to Fort St. Philip. He then ordered the Itzka about and surged full steam toward the barrier. Driving the bow between the third and fourth hulks, Caldwell broke the chain and created a large gap in the obstruction. The Pipanola followed, cutting another opening through the linkage of the hulks, logs, and chains. Knowing this, Farragut wanted to run past the fort on the night of the 22nd, but the Mississippi, not to be confused with the incomplete Confederate ironclad, was not ready. During the day, British and French naval officers came down from New Orleans. They warned Farragut that the forts would destroy his fleet if he tried to steam past. When Farragut repeated their report to Porter, the latter promised that, with another day's bombardment, he could ensure that they would pass, with the loss of no more than one ship. Thus, Porter's mortar schooners continued to bombard the forts for another day, but without damaging them any further. In fact, both Confederate and the Union officers would later state that when Farragut moved against them, the two forts were as strong as they had been before the bombardment began. But now the crisis was at hand. On the 23rd, the Confederates knew something was imminent. Lookouts saw the surveyors planting new flags along the river bank upriver from the position of the mortar schooners. Many believed Farragut intended to use his gunboats to attack the forts. The Confederate ships lined the river bank north of Fort St. Philip. The ram Stonewall Jackson was farther upriver to guard the canals in case Farragut chose to bypass the forts. In his initial plan, Farragut intended to lead the attack and crush any opposition with the firepower of these ships. His lieutenant argued that leading from the front was unwise for the commander. So Farragut agreed to let Captain Theodore Spaley lead the attack with a division comprised of eight lesser ships. Farragut's flotilla would be in the middle, and Bell would bring up the rear with a division of six small gunboats. Farragut gave Porter a role to play in the attack. The mortars would suppress the fire from the forts with the barrage, while the gunboats attacked the water battery below Fort Jackson. At 1.55 a.m., it was now the early morning of April 24th, the Hartford raised two red lights, the signal to advance. For an hour and a half, Farragut waited while the ships pulled in their anchors. It was not until almost 3.30 before the Cayuga had her anchor in and could start forward. At the approach of the Union ships, the Confederate lookouts fled to the swamps without lighting the signal fire. Thus, with as little noise as possible, Bailey's ships moved forward to the gap in the barrier. At the water battery, Confederate artillery officers could see movement but were unsure what it was. On board the Louisiana State Sidewheeler gunboat Governor Moore, Kennan thought that he had heard the splashing sound of Mississippi's paddle wheels. 
He descended toward the river to try to get in a better position to hear. As he reached the deck, cannon in both forts opened fire, and the Union ships returned it. The bursting of every description of shells quickly following their discharge increased a hundredfold the terrific noise and fearfully grand and magnificent pyrotechnic display, which centered in a space of about 1,200 yards in width. Cannon later wrote, the Cayuga, mounting four guns, led the Union line forward. She passed through the hulks without incident, but as she approached the forts, cannon fire began to hit her before she could even fire back. Cannon ordered this crew to get the steam up on the Governor Moore. In three minutes, she was ready to sortie, but found herself in chaos at the Confederate position. Until the Manassas moved, the gunboat was trapped where she was. On the Manassas, Worley cast the lines off from the tug and turned the ram's bow to move down river. As the ironclad started to turn, the moor started forward and immediately collided with the tug Bella Algeen. The Manassas steamed down the river faster than Worley thought possible, but still the ironclad was slow. The first ship she encountered was the river defense fleet ram Resolute, which she struck on the side. She then exchanged shots with the Mississippi, which steamed away. Next, she tried to ram the Pensacola, but the Union ship deftly maneuvered out of the way. Worley knew he could not keep up with the ships moving upriver, so he decided to go down to engage the mortar fleet. When the Manassas was between the forts, both opened fire on the ship, mistaking it for a drifting Union vessel. He turned the bow of the ironclad upriver. With no room to ram, Cannon took more up the east bank of the river until he could get a chance to turn and come down with the current. This would also get him out of the way of the fire between the forts and the Union ships. Meanwhile, Porter ran his steamers up alongside the levee, just below the water battery. When the Confederate forts opened fire, his ships delivered a broadside of 27 guns into the Confederate batteries. The Confederates returned fire, but the levee protected the hulls of the steamers. Confederate shells passed through the rigging, but did no major damage. Porter thought he had silenced the guns in the water battery after ten minutes, so he gave the order to fire at Fort Jackson. Upstream from the forts, a fight erupted between the Union ships and some of the Confederate fleet. Trying to help, Cannon turned the moor down river to attack and found the Union ships Oneida and Cayuga to his port. To their challenge, what ship is this? And knowing the only Union paddle wheel was the Mississippi, he called back, the United States steamer Mississippi. But the blue identification light on the moor's mast revealed her identity. The, the Oneida gave her a broadside. Others joined in, raking the Confederate gunboat, killing crew members at the bow guns and in the bunkers. Then the Varuna shot past Moore on her way up river. Cannon knew General Duncan was on the steamer to Bloom, not far ahead, so he had decided he had to do something to delay or destroy her. To hide the identity of his ship, Cannon used a musket to shoot out the identification lantern. He ordered the crew to show white and red lights, like the Union ships. The Varuna had half a mile head start when the moor turned up river and started after her, but the gap separating them lessened with each minute because steam pressure was low in the Union ship. Cannon poured oil on the coal to make it burn hotter. The two vessels overtook and passed the ram Stonewall Jackson, struggling in a maneuver up river against the current. The passage was not without incident. When the Hartford unleashed her first broadside, the smoke hit her from the Brooklyn. Captain Thomas Craven thought he saw the flag ahead of him. Suddenly, the sloop shuddered as he ran over one of the hulks in the river. A few minutes later, she did the same to one of the moored tree trunks. Then she almost ran aground under the walls of Fort St. Philip. As the Brooklyn passed Fort Jackson, a shot struck the rail and plowed into the deck. Another cut the signal quartermaster in half. When abreast of the fort, two shots hit near a gun, decapitating the gun captain and wounding nine men. 
Then the Richmond, which was a slow ship, became entangled in the barrier. She ran so close to Fort Jackson that Alden would write that they could have thrown a stone from her deck into the fort. When the Hartford was beyond the forts, Farragut saw the fire raft come toward them, pushed by the tug Moser. When Farragut gave the order, hard a port, the Hartford moved only a short distance before running into the bank. They were so close to Fort St. Philip that they could hear gunners giving orders. They were even closer than the Confederates thought. The rebel shots passed overhead without doing any damage. Then the tug pushed the fire raft up against the Hartford, but a broadside from the Union sloop sent the tug to the bottom. On the Hartford's deck, the fire rafts made it as bright as noon. The danger to the ship was severe. An officer passing Farragut heard him exclaim, My God, is it to end in this way? But the crisis passed when a master's mate climbed into the rigging with a fire hose and put out the fire. As the Brooklyn passed Fort Jackson, its crew saw the Hartford on the bank with flames running up the rigging. Craven ordered the engines to a halt. The Brooklyn fell down river until she was between the fort and the Hartford. The Confederates then renewed their fire on the Brooklyn, but they aimed high. Their shots passed through the rigging. The Brooklyn returned fire from its port battery as fast as the men could load and fire. When Farragut gave the order to reverse engines, the Hartford freed itself off the bank and their fire raft with a jolt. Seeing the Hartford free, Craven took the Brooklyn further upriver. As she passed Fort Phillip, her guns raked the Confederate batteries with canister. The Confederates opened fire with muskets, but after suffering a few shots of grape, they stopped. Beyond Fort St. Philip, the Brooklyn saw the Louisiana tied up to the bank. Craven ordered his crew to load round shot in the starboard battery. The ironclad, though, got off the first shots, firing as the Union warship approached. Then, as the Brooklyn began to pass, the Louisiana's crew closed the port shutters so the balls from the broadside just bounced off. One of the Louisiana's nine-inch shots had struck the Brooklyn about a foot above the waterline, passing through three feet of wood before stopping. When the Brooklyn's crews later dug out the shell, they discovered that in the Louisiana's gunner's haste to fire, they had failed to remove the lead patch from the fuse, so the shell could not explode. Had it gone off, it would have blown off the bow of the Brooklyn and sunk her. A few moments later, a lookout on the Brooklyn yelled, A steamer coming down on our port. Midshipman John Bartlett went to the poop ladder to get a better look. I saw a good-sized river steamer coming down on us, crowned with her men on her forward deck, as if ready to board. The order had already been given, stand by to repel boarders, and to load with shrapnel. The fuses were cut to burn one second. Craven gave the order to bring the bow to starboard. As the guns came to bear, the Brooklyn and the Confederate attacker each opened fire, the shells exploding as they left the muzzle as though they were huge shotguns. By the time Bartlett's number 10 gun was in position, he could no longer see the target through the smoke. But it was too late. The impact threw Bartlett from his feet. I ran to the number 10 porch, the gun being in, and looked out and saw her almost directly alongside. A man came out of her little hatch aft and ran forward along the port side of the deck as far as the smokestacks, placed his hand against one, and looked to see what damage the ram had done. Before he could return to safety, a fellow crewman on the Brooklyn knocked him into the water. It was the ram Manassas, which had smashed into the Brooklyn at a full coal bunker. Craven sent a carpenter below. The man reported little damage, but when the crew later emptied the bunker, they discovered how severe the impact had been. Had the Manassas rammed her almost anywhere else, the blow would have sunk her. The Federal 3rd Division then started through with little trouble. There were so many Union ships, however, that it was daylight before the final three began their run past the forts. 
The Kennebec led the Issaca and Winona into the barrier, where they became stuck. A shell struck the boiler of the Itska, and she drifted down the river. Caldwell ordered the crew to lay down on the deck until they were out of range. The Winona tried going through in daylight and was badly shot up. The Confederate gunboat McCray fired at every Union ship as it passed, but most did not fire back, thinking she was a Union vessel. Its luck ran out with the 3rd Division, however. Most of the shots from the Union gunboats missed, but one started a fire. Three were disgorging broadsides at the Confederate ship when the Manassas chased them off. The McRae then drifted down to Fort St. Philip. Further upstream, as they approached the Salamette about dawn, Cannon gave the order for the moor to fire at the Varuna. The two ships traded shots with neither hitting. Cannon thought the Union ship was afraid to give her a broadside for fear the moor would ram her. Because the bow gun and the moor was in the wrong position, Cannon ordered a shot through her deck to try to reach the Union ship's boilers. The tactic worked. Moore's first shot went through the Verona smokestack. A second shot disabled a pivot gun. Then the Governor Moore rammed the Verona twice. Next, the Stonewall Jackson rammed her twice on the other side. The impact of the ramming the Union ship broke a steam pipe connection on the Jackson, crippling her. The Verona then ran in her into a shawl water where she sank. Cannon's moment of triumph on the moor was brief. More Union ships came into sight. He gave the order to ram, but gunfire raked the Governor Moore before she could close. With 54 killed and 17 wounded out of a crew of 93, Cannon ordered what remained of the crew to burn the ship. <laughs> North of the forts, at quarantine point, Farragut gathered his ships. When the Manassas appeared after dawn, he shouted the order, Send the Mississippi to sink that damn thing. As the paddle wheeler turned down river, the Cano joined her. Thus, Worley saw two warships bearing down on him. With his cannon disabled and unable to ram against the current, he decided his duty lay in trying to save his crew. He ordered them to run the ironclad up on the eastern river bank. His crew escaped through a front gun port to the swamps beyond the river. Farragut now took stock of the situation. He had one ship sunk, the Verona, and three missing. Most of the Confederate ships had been sunk or destroyed. He sent the Cayuga up the river and the Mississippi back down to stand guard. He then ordered the remainder of his fleet up to New Orleans. The Navy had done the fighting, and he wanted to ensure that the city surrendered to it, and not to Butler's troops. Craven had warned him six weeks before that if the attack failed, the failure would be attributed to Farragut, but that if it succeeded, credit might well go to Porter and Butler. Down at the forts, Porter demanded surrender. When Hagen's refused, the mortar schooners opened fire again, with the same lack of success. Not until Porter sent some of Butler's troops through the bayous to land behind the forts did Hagen agree to capitulate. The fight for one of the richest prizes of the Confederacy was all but over. With its port city at the mouth of the Mississippi in federal hands, its potential exports of cotton and grains was bound to suffer. From the South, it was a grievous loss, and one never retrieved. For Farragut, New Orleans was only a step to further triumph as he worked his way north, increasingly cutting the Confederacy between eastern and western parts. The severance would be complete when Farragut teamed with Ulysses S. Grant to wrest the south of Vicksburg. It's your history. Learn it. Know it. Love it. Like and follow so you don't miss any of the exciting episodes from Mad Hatter's Civil War History.